Hello everyone, this is Yours Trivia, and today we're starting a brand new Let's Talk Lore series covering the Han Zhong campaign that took place from 217 to 219 as Liu Bei and Cao Cao battle for control of the Han Zhong region. Now to start our series, we have to first talk about the importance of Han Zhong for both Cao Cao and Liu Bei. First, in terms of geographic location, the Han Zhong commandery is a fertile river valley surrounded by the Qinling mountain ranges to the north and the Daba mountain ranges in the south. Enriched by the Han River, which runs across it, the Han Zhong commandery is capable of producing enough food to support more than 200,000 inhabitants and provide the natural resting place for armies trying to move through the numerous mountain ranges that separate the Shuba region from Chang'an and the rest of the central plains. And this is the reason why both Cao Cao and Liu Bei will fight at all costs to secure it. For Cao Cao, controlling Han Zhong would be akin to controlling Liu Bei's front door. While Liu Bei might have stolen the lucrative Yi province from Liu Zhang, but without Han Zhong, he is merely a trapped rat unable to march out from these mountain ranges to challenge Cao Cao. Conversely, Liu Bei needs Han Zhong to launch his campaigns against Cao Cao and the Central Plain if he has any hope of recapturing China and establishing the Han again. And he has two paths from the Han Zhong region, either north through the various Shu Pass to reach the Liang province and Chang'an, or he could even sail down the Han River eastward through Shangyong to reach Guan Yu in the Jin province. And speaking of these Shu Pass, we need to take a look at the map here, which shows the various Shu Pass built during the spring autumn period to connect the kingdom of Shu to the kingdom of Qin. And to help you associate these paths with geographic features, I'm going to switch over to this map here, which is missing the Mount Qi path to the west, but for the purpose of our Han Zhong campaign, this will be fine. Now notably on this map is the three path that goes from the Shu Ba region into Han Zhong in the Jinyu path, which connects Chengdu to Han Zhong, the Mi Cang path, which connects Ba Zhong to Han Zhong, and the Li Zhi path, which connects the Yangtze River to Han Zhong. Then, of course, there are the five northern paths. First is the missing Mount Xi path that Zhuge Liang will actually take six times during his northern campaign. And then the Chen Chang path, which will be featured prominently in Zhuge Liang's second northern expedition. Followed by the Bao Xie path and the Tang Luo path in the middle. And that leaves the Zibu path on the east, which is the one that Wei Yan famously wanted to take for a direct attack on Chang'an. So it's pretty clear from these maps why Han Zhong is so important, as it is essentially the central hub that connects to all these paths. But even though these are called paths, do not mistake them for actual roads. The Shu paths are notoriously difficult to traverse, and even if we look at the Jinyu path, which had the best quality road of all these as it did not have to traverse through the most difficult terrains, the path would look like this. And of course, we are seeing the modern renovated versions of these paths, as it was often the case that the old path would just have wooden planks slotted into the mountainside as proxies for road. And in some places, the Shu path didn't even have wooden planks, as you can see here. And of course, these metal chain railings is also a modern addition. So you can understand the difficulties Zhuge Liang went through on his numerous northern expeditions, as well as why Zhuge Liang did not believe Wei Yan's Ziwu Pass plan would actually work, as Ziwu Pass was in the worst condition of all of these paths, and also how surprised the Shu Han forces were when the Wei forces finally invaded them without using any one of these established paths as they went through the actual wilderness and the mountains, as these type of paths was the best option, so you can imagine how going through the wilderness will be much more difficult. Therefore, in 215, with Cao Cao launching his Hanzhong campaign against Zhang Lu, with over 10,000 troops, it's not surprising that Zhang Lu's brother would foolishly and confidently believe he can hold them off at Yangping Gate. Now, if you will notice, Yangping Gate is actually the western gate of Hanzhong, but Cao Cao is clearly coming from their east. 
And the reason for this is because the four Shu Pass from Hanzhong to Chang'an is rather unsuitable for large armies to move through. So it's far easier for Cao Cao to actually march past Chang'an and loop around at Wudu to take the Mount Qi Pass to arrive at Hanzhong from the west. And this is the exact same reason why Zhuge Liang kept insisting on taking the Mount Qi Path on almost all his northern expeditions, as this was indeed the only pass that was suitable for mass army mobilization, thanks to the fact that it hugs the Han River for the majority of its path, which means you can move supplies easily along the river. Now, at Yangping Gate, Zhang Lu's brother Zhang Wei would be no match for Cao Cao's forces, as he would be defeated, and the gate of Hanzhong would now be wide open for Cao Cao's forces. Zhang Lu had originally wanted to surrender, and now definitely wanted to surrender on the spot to Cao Cao, but on the advice of his advisor Yan Pu, Zhang Lu was convinced to retreat his unit south to the Ba region to join forces with Pu Hu, who was a tribal chief in this area, and give the appearance of continued resistance in order to buy themselves more equity when they do surrender, as surrendering now following Zhang Wei's defeat will be surrendering from a position of weakness. And this move did indeed pay off for Zhang Lu in the end, as he eventually did surrender from a much better position of strength, but not for the reasons that Yan Pu had predicted. First off, the Ba region that Zhang Lu is now retreating into is in the Yi province, which is under Liu Bei's jurisdiction now, and this move triggered Liu Bei's attempt to persuade Zhang Lu to surrender to him instead of Cao Cao. But Zhang Lu did not see Liu Bei as a legitimate ruler and stated that he would never bow down to Liu Bei. And at the same time, the chieftain that he had wanted to join, Pu Hu, betrayed him, as Pu Hu would actually surrender the seven tribes under his command directly over to Cao Cao, thus forcing Zhang Lu to surrender right away or face being surrounded by Cao Cao from the north and the tribal forces in the south. But thankfully, because Liu Bei had reached out to make an offer to him, Cao Cao felt compelled to offer Zhang Lu attractive terms, as he did not want to risk Zhang Lu picking Liu Bei over him. And as we have already mentioned before, Zhang Lu had always wanted to surrender to Cao Cao anyways, so Zhang Lu took up Cao Cao's offer as he was awarded the title of General who garrisoned the South and a Marquis title on top of that, while all five of his sons were also given second Marquis titles, while his daughter ended up marrying Cao Cao's son, Cao Yu. And the only condition that Zhang Lu had to follow was to move his entire clan to Ye, as Cao Cao would never trust him to stay in Hanzhong. Now, historical record indicates that after moving to Ye, Zhang Lu would die in the very next year, but because of his religious ties with the Taoism sect called the Five Peck of Rice, there are less trustworthy religious sources that claim Zhang Lu actually lived to the year 245 or 29 years later, only to be reborn in the year 259. And of course, we don't have to believe these as historical, as there are legends with the celestial master line of the Zhang clan, all living past 100. Now, we won't be talking too much about Zhang Lu and his Talus ties here, but if you are interested, definitely go check out our Zhang Lu Let's Talk Lore series from the past for more information. So with Han Zhong and even a large area of the Ba region now suddenly under Cao Cao's control, Liu Bei had to act as if he would lose Han Zhong here, he would become a sitting duck in the Yi province at the mercy of Cao Cao's assaults. So after being advised on the severity of the situation by Huang Quan, Liu Bei sent Huang Quan to take a force to the Bazhong region to first retake it from the tribal chieftain Pu Hu, who had surrendered to Cao Cao. And yes, Huang Quan is the same Huang Quan who had tried to persuade Liu Zhang to not take in Liu Bei, and he now serves as Liu Bei's general. And he would make quick work of the local tribes to retake this area, then with Cao Cao once again forced to return back to the Central Plains to deal with more regional rebellions and Sun Quan's renewed attack on Hefei, the West had to be entrusted once again to Xia Yuan and Zhang He. Except this time, Cao Cao did leave behind Cao Hong and Cao Xiu to assist them. 
since their opponent is now Liu Bei. And to be clear, Sun Quan had been causing problems for both Cao Cao and Liu Bei throughout this Hanzhong campaign. First, when Liu Bei had just taken the Yi province, Sun Quan wanted Liu Bei to return the parts of the Jin province that he had given him after Zhou Yu's death. But Liu Bei refused, stating that he will return them only once he takes the Liang province. So feeling cheated, Sun Quan launched an assault on the poorly defended southern three commanderies of Changsha, Lingling, and Guiyang. And after losing these territories, Liu Bei had actually made a trip back to Gongan in the Jin province with 50,000 troops, as he and Guan Yu postured for attack on Wu. But upon hearing Cao Cao's campaign against Zhang Lu, Liu Bei had to quickly return to the Yi province, as Guan Yu and Sun Quan signed a new agreement regarding the land of the Jin province, as Sun Quan will now take control of all of the southern holdings that he had stolen from Guan Yu, while Guan Yu will be able to retain the northern parts that include Jiangxia and the Nan commandery. So technically from this point forward, Sun Quan would no longer have any moral high ground in regards to the Jin province, as they had lent Liu Bei one commandery in the Nan commandery, and now taken back three by force, and even had agreement with Guan Yu about how they would split the Jin province. Obviously, this will matter in our future series regarding Guan Yu's last dance when we cover his attack on Fan Castle and the betrayal by Sun Quan. But for the time being, we just need to take note that Sun Quan had caused trouble for Liu Bei in the early stages of the Hanzhong campaign before initiating his most infamous failure at attacking Hefei in late 215, which ended up forcing Cao Cao to personally return from Hanzhong. Now returning to the main stage at Hanzhong, following Huang Quan's successful attack against the local tribes in the Ba region, Xia Houyuan tried to respond by sending Zhang He to try to retake this area, or at the very least, force the migration of the local populace, as Three Kingdoms was much more a war for population rather than a war for land, as we had mentioned in our previous series covering Cao Cao's conquest of the north. Since the height of the Eastern Han Dynasty, the population numbers have drastically declined due to war, climate change, famine, and plague. So during the Three Kingdom period, all Three Kingdoms had more land than people to tend them. Thus, the fight over population directly correlated with the strength of the kingdom. And to stop Zhang He's attempt to retake the Ba region and steal its citizens, Liu Bei would send his best in Zhang Fei, and these two forces would clash and stall in the narrow mountain passes for over 50 days, before Zhang Fei cleverly took his elite force of 10,000 men to climb through difficult terrain to trap Zhang He's forces from both sides of this mountain pass. Then when Zhang Fei resumed his assault from both end of Zhang He's troops, Zhang He was trapped in between, and due to the narrow terrain, Zhang He could not utilize his numbers advantage to break through from either end. And in the end, Zhang He's entire force was wiped out as he and a dozen or so guards managed to abandon their horses and climb over the mountains themselves to escape from Zhang Fei's troops. Now with Cao Cao's forces chased out of the Yi province, the next step for Liu Bei would be to attack them in Hanzhong, as we will end our episode here and come back next time to discuss the early phase of this arduous campaign. So hopefully you all enjoy this episode, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!